What is this? And what is this? Do you see any similarities between the two images? The top one is the ignition secondary electrical pattern and the bottom one is the human heart electrical pattern. We call these waveforms. An EKG records electrical signals in your heart and doctors use it to detect heart problems. A waveform records electrical signals in the engine and technicians use it to detect engine problems and they can tell you a lot. For example, if you look at the red arrow below, well that means there is a lean cylinder which causes hydrocarbons to rise because of a misfire. That's how you would interpret that. And if you look at the arrow on the bottom, that's a fouled spark plug or shorted spark plug wire. So you see, just by being able to interpret waveforms, it can lead you to what the problem is. So let's look at teaching ourselves a study on ignition waveforms. This is a very detailed breakdown and description of secondary waveform analysis. It is a great skill to master, but it will take some time. You may need to watch and refer to this video several times to grasp it all. There are two types of ignition systems. A capacitive discharge, which uses a capacitor or battery as the source of the power and an inductive discharge which uses electromagnetism as the source of power. What is electromagnetism? It is current moving in a wire and it will induce a magnetic field around the wire. And there's a picture to illustrate that. The inductive forces is what creates the waveform. Disturbances to that force are what we use to identify a problem. So ignition waveform patterns. Now if you look at both of these, the top is alphabetically starting with A and the bottom, the human heart, is alphabetical starting with P. So it basically just means that it progresses just in a normal fashion. The waveform at the top, which is secondary, the A, the first thing, corresponds to P in the human heart. Both of those are the first things that occur and then so on until they're all covered. So in secondary waveform analysis, whenever we're studying anything electrical, what are we looking at? Well, whenever we're studying anything electrical, we're looking at basically Ohm's law in action. Now, you know, in Ohm's law, each element is directly related to the other. As one changes, so will the other, volts, current, and resistance. Now, waveforms are no different. When one element changes, so do the others. So to get this waveform, we use a magnetic induction probe. There are various styles of induction probes. Here's just a few of them. Now, clamp meters rely on the principle of magnetic induction to make non-contact AC current measurements. Electric current flowing through a wire produces a magnetic field. So in secondary waveform analysis, what exactly are we looking at? Well, we're looking at Ohm's law in action, volts, current, and resistance. Now this is a known good pattern. This is what it should look like. Now you see that on the left side we always have our voltage going up and down and on the bottom is our sweep or our time span. And we always read left to right. Now since we read left to right, let's start left to right. So the first place we start at this red arrow is on the left and this is indicating system voltage somewhere around 12.6 or 14.6 if the battery is good. No current is flowing, nothing is on. We just have static system voltage. So since nothing is on, we have not dropped any voltage. Remember voltage drop testing? We have to have something on. So keep in mind, we're looking now at a secondary waveform, not the primary. Now this is an example of both primary and secondary. And if you look at the top one that is green, that's the primary current. And the bottom one, which is red, that is your secondary voltage. Remember the difference between current and voltage? Now this is, of course, obtained from using a two-channel lab scope. The top one, you get that by using an amp probe. 
and the bottom by using an inductive pickup. Now this next part may be a little bit confusing, so keep in mind, magnetic field, current flowing through a wire. Yes, current is being pushed through the wire by voltage overcoming resistance. But remember, we're looking at the magnetic field that it creates. To see the current, we would need a current clamp like this. Clamp meters and adapters measure this field using one of two technologies. Both technologies measure this magnetic field, but with a slightly different sensing method. For DC currents, it uses Hall effect, and for AC currents, it uses inductive technology. Hall effect and induction are both non-contact technologies based on the principle that for a given current flow, a proportional magnetic field is produced around the current carrying conductor. This creates a signal. That signal, which is proportional to current, is then amplified and measured and then displayed as a waveform. So what you see displayed is created by which method or which tool you're using. So current flowing through a wire can be measured in two ways, either with an inductive sensor or with a Hall effect. The inductive sensor is for our secondary waveform and the Hall effect creates our primary waveform. Now since primary happens first, let's look at it by itself. The primary event is mirrored in the secondary, but we can't see it because we're looking at electromotive force, not current. A mirror image is one thing seen from two viewpoints. So the primary event is mirrored in the secondary. We can't see it because of the inductive and Hall effect. They're both different methods. Now using a one channel lap scope, the primary current waveform by itself would look like this. Now this is current, not voltage. It's read as amps and the primary current waveform by itself would look just like this. Now this is both primary and secondary superimposed on top of each other. Remember the mirror effect? You're looking at the same thing from two different perspectives. Current from a Hall effect and voltage from electromotive force. The coil on and off events, they happen at the same time. So in the primary and the secondary, we can see they happen at the same time, both on and off. Now when you're looking at a secondary waveform, if something did not look right in this area, you would switch to current ramping for more detail. Since most newer ignitions today use coil unplug, and because both primary and secondary events can be seen, we'll use the secondary waveform from here on. So we have the primary turn on point. That's the ignition starting point. The ignition module grounds the primary circuit. The coil is a load. It has voltage, so when it gets ground, you should see the voltage drop. It's being turned on, right? And then you'll see oscillations. What are oscillations? It's startup speed. From a dead stop, it takes time to reach full acceleration. It takes time for current to overcome the dead stop resistance in a circuit. So our ignition starting point, the ignition module grounds that primary circuit and we see the oscillations. Now the oscillations are only seen in the secondary waveform. You won't see them in the primary. The primary current begins to flow and the waveform it would look like that. But again, that would be looking at the primary waveform. Now the primary is mirrored in the secondary. So you're actually seeing the primary and the secondary events on top of each other. So there's your primary on top of the secondary. Now remember, only primary current is flowing at this point, but only the secondary is visible. See what I said about it being a little bit confusing? Now let's keep going. The primary current limiting is the next, if there is current limiting. The module or the PCM limit current to protect the coil in the module. Why would we not see a current limit bump? Because some systems don't limit current. The left one is an example of current not being limited, so you can see the peak going up. The right one is an example of current being limited, so the peak cannot reach all the way to the top. 
So know your system before you condemn it. Now we have two arrows. This is your primary dwell period. Dwell means how long is the current on? How long is it flowing? Primary current is flowing at this point. A magnetic field develops so the coil saturates. What does it mean when a coil saturates? It reaches its full potential. In other words, it can't hold anymore. The bucket is full. So dwell how long it is on. The coil saturates, reaches its full potential. And now our next arrow is the end of the primary dwell period. So in other words, it's not on. That's the very end of it. The end of the primary dwell period, it is no longer on. Now this red arrow indicates the primary turnoff point. That's the end of the primary dwell period. It's no longer on. The module opens the primary circuit, the primary magnetic field collapses, and voltage is induced into the secondary coil windings. Now, to understand how that voltage is induced, you're going to need to refer to a different video, which is titled, How a Transistor Coil Works. That would explain that. So the voltage is induced to the secondary coil windings, and that voltage is multiplied by the number of coil turns the secondary voltage discharge occurs and that is called the firing line or the voltage spike which is the firing line it appears to be truly vertical at this time base now if it's not truly vertical that's a problem it takes a few milliseconds to ionize now this red arrow is your peak firing kV or kilovolts now here's an example of a firing line that is higher than the rest See from the bottom left to the right, 153624, number 4 has a much higher firing line than the rest. So what is this peak firing KV? It's voltage required to ionize the gaps in the secondary circuit, which is the spark plug gap. To ionize, it means to ignite the fuel, both intended and unintended. Notice now, everything up to this point is occurring outside of the combustion chamber. Now, what is the intended gap and what is the unintended gap? The intended gap is a spark plug gap. It's intended to be there. The unintended gap, now that's going to need a little bit more of an explanation. Now, contrary to popular belief, peak KV is not affected by high resistance in the spark plug wires. No current is flowing in the secondary circuit at this point. Therefore, resistance in the spark plug wires does not come into play. Since there's no flow, resistance has nothing to resist. Again, notice that everything up to this point is occurring outside of the combustion chamber. Now remember, we're talking about volts, resistance, and current. What happens inside the combustion chamber affects the amount of voltage required to ionize the spark plug gap. Because these things vary, peak KV will also vary. KV demand will increase due to retarded timing, lean conditions, increase in cylinder pressures, and excessive spark plug gap. KV demand will decrease due to advanced timing, a rich condition, decrease in cylinder pressures, and a small spark plug gap. This is peak KV. Now, no secondary current is flowing yet. Keep that in mind. Secondary current doesn't flow until we get to this point. That's next. And we call that the spark line. Volts for spark across the gap. Many techs spend too much time analyzing the firing line. By analyzing the spark line, we can see current conditions inside the combustion chamber. It's kind of like having x-ray vision. You can see things that are not visible from the outside. As combustion chamber conditions change, the voltage required to maintain the spark plug gap will change. These changes will be represented as fluctuations on the spark line. And these changes you could see right in this area. Now here's an example of fluctuations on the spark line. What affects the spark line? which is how much voltage is required to bridge the gap. What affects the spark line? 
Well, air fuel ratio, compression, valve sealing, secondary resistance, and where would you see that? Right here in the spark line. So what do we look at? Well, we look at spark KV, spark line slope, spark turbulence, and spark duration. Where do we look? Right here. And now this red arrow indicates the spark KV, or the point where the spark line intersects with the firing line. And this is the point where the secondary spark begins to bridge the spark plug gap, and secondary current begins to flow. So this is the firing KV at the top and the spark KV at the bottom. Notice the difference. Anything that increases the amount of voltage required to bridge the spark plug gap will be seen as an increase in the spark KV. Since secondary current is now flowing in the circuit, secondary resistance now plays a part in this, and you can see it in the waveform by looking at what we call the slope line. The slope of this line represents increasing or decreasing voltage that's required to maintain the spark across the gap. A relatively horizontal line means that the voltage required to maintain that spark across the gap did not change. No significant changes to the conditions inside the chamber. Now an upward slope, now that indicates that there is an increased voltage demand while spark is crossing the spark plug gap. Increased resistance inside the chamber. Now the downward slope indicates decreased voltage demand while the spark is crossing the spark plug, which is a decreased resistance in the combustion chamber. Here is an example of a spark line that is sloped up on all cylinders. Now a tech tip here is all spark lines will slope up at the very end. This is the flame burning out, so resistance is going down and voltage is going up. Where? Right here. So look for the slope in the first red portion of the slope line because all of them will go up the very tail of the spark line. Where do we look for it? Right here, in the slope, in the middle of the slope, because the tail part will always be sloped up on all. Now the next part is your spark duration, or the length of time the spark actually bridges the gap. The primary function of the ignition system is to maintain spark for as long as there are available hydrocarbons present in order to achieve a complete and controlled efficient burn. That's called spark duration. Spark duration is also referred to as our burn time. The single feature that most scopes will display accurately, regardless of any of the factor, is the burn time, and it's usually one millisecond to two milliseconds in duration. Now here's our secondary burnout. The secondary burnout is where the spark literally blows out. At this point there is no longer enough energy to maintain the spark across that spark plug gap, and the flame just literally blows out. Now these are coil oscillations. It's kind of like a bouncing ball. The first bounce is always stronger and then decreases over time. So the rule of thumb here is that you should be two to four bounces. No bounces indicate that you have a very weak coil. Now remember, this is one continuous event. From the point of primary turnoff to the end of the coil oscillations, this is one single continuous discharge of electrical energy. The amount of available energy will be the same for every event. All of the available energy will either be used or dissipated during the secondary event. So, what's the rule of thumb for a good or bad waveform? The spark line is the focal point for overall secondary health. Dwell is the focal point for overall primary health. Now let's look at some real ignition waveform problems. First, a few primary problems. Here are four primary ignition current ramps. Now the top left, that is a good one. Now it has current limiting, so look at that little circle area. From there on up, going up, and then it limits the current. Now the one below there almost looks like it is a non-current limited coil, but look at the area inside the red circle. See the difference from the one above? Now the top right you have an open plug wire, 
in the primary. Now that is indicated because of the negative voltage. And here again you have a known good on the bottom right. Now let's look at some real secondary problems. The top left is a good one and the bottom right is a bad one. It's pretty much the same pattern. Now what do you see that's bad? Look at the KV lines and then look at the slope lines. Each one has a distortion to it. Here's another one. Now this is a bad spark plug wire. And another one. Look at the slope line. Look at the KV and the spark line. The injector for cylinder 4 has been disconnected so cylinder 4 has no fuel and this is during a snap throttle. What about this one? We have faulty plug wires and it is under load or in other words at 2200 RPM. This is faulty spark plug wires under load at 2200 RPM. Now since it is under load and our RPM is faster the scope has automatically changed our time base. That's why it looks like those KV lines aren't complete, but that's because it's just outpacing the ability of the scope to paint that picture right now. Here's another one. This vehicle came in with code P0303. Cylinder number 3 misfire. New spark plugs and wires fixed it. And again, this one was captured at idle. What about this one? Look at the bottom. The number 6 spark plug wire is open. That's why we have extremely high KV. What about this one? A snap throttle test with injector 4 disconnected. Notice the KV. Notice the slope of the burn line, especially compared to the other ones. Here's another one that has a bad plug wire. And another one, number six. Cylinder number six has a misfire. Your cranking compression for that cylinder was only 40 psi. Look at the slope line, number six, especially compared to the other ones. Another one. At idle, we had a misfire under load with code P0304 stored in the memory. The problem was a bad plug wire. And on this one here, on this one we have an exhaust valve sticking open at idle causing misfire. The air fuel ratio on this cylinder is very poor. We have enough fuel to start but not enough to sustain a good burn time. Look at the burn, the slope of the burn line. Of course there are some OEM ignition systems that have advanced designs like this one which is the Ford Multi-Strike. These variations need to be covered separately. So here is what we need to remember. Compare. Comparative analysis is the best way to determine if something is good or bad. Link the waveform with the symptoms. There should be a direct relationship to the problem you are having. Now you may be saying, how in the world do I get a secondary waveform? So stay tuned. We're going to do a video on how to obtain a secondary waveform. Thanks for watching.